I'm here today to showcase uh, creative digital technologies in remote and cultural environments. So the way that I deliver the majority of my training is on country, in community, and in a way that's inclusive of and celebratory of culture. And the reason for this is that's because where I am, um, this is what works in terms of outcomes and engagement. So I'll quickly start with a bit of background information uh, about myself, just because then the examples that I give, I think will make more sense. So my name is Tegan Mossop and I work for North Regional TAFE and I teach employability skills and I also support students with language literacy and numeracy. I'm the only representative of North Regional TAFE at a remote campus in Fitzroy Crossing, which is sort of smack bang in the middle of the Kimberley if you've ever been through there. And I've been there for uh, three and a half years. So over 95% of my students are Indigenous and live in a remote setting. So I'd like to first just set the scene of some of the issues and some of the challenges uh, for many Indigenous people who live remote. So in the photo here that you can see, I'm delivering out on community and there was no training centre, there wasn't even a room that we could use. Um, we used to squat a veranda quite frequently and having a veranda is actually a good case scenario in, in a lot of, on a lot of occasions and often we don't even have that and I find myself under a tree um, quite frequently in the situations that I'm in with my training. And this is, a, I guess, uh, a prime example of remote disadvantage and what that really means. I mean, what, I mean, what does it really mean? What's the difference? Why is there a disadvantage with living, living remote? Uh, basically, it's just because there's such large distances that need to be covered in, to obtain services. So the costs and the challenges of being able to access education, employment or health um, are part of the overall disadvantage for remote communities or towns. So I'd like to show you a fact sheet about remote disadvantage. The Australian government recognises a remote disadvantage that primarily affects Indigenous people, not only, but primarily. So what is life like for Indigenous people in remote areas? So, on average, Indigenous people in remote areas are disadvantaged in housing, access to services and job opportunities. Housing overcrowding is much higher for Indigenous people in remote areas and they often have to travel long distances to access health, education and other services. And you can see in this pie graph, this is the reason, one of the reasons why it primarily affects Indigenous people because 25% of Indigenous people live remote compared with only 2% of non-Indigenous people. Now, education in train in, and training in remote areas. So in remote areas, average learning outcomes for Indigenous students were lower than for other students. In remote areas, lower proportions of Indigenous people have completed school. In remote, excluding very remote areas in 2008, 36% of Indigenous 20 to 24 year olds had attained a year 12 equivalent or above compared with 82% of non-Indigenous 20 to 24 year olds. And that's excluding very remote. If that was including very remote, uh, those statistics would surely be lower. Um, and fewer had or were studying for tertiary qualifications. So in remote, excluding very remote areas in 2008, 24% of Indigenous 20 to 64 year olds had or were studying for a qualification of Cert 3 or higher compared with 49% of non-Indigenous 20 to 64 year olds. These stats um, are from 2010, so they are a little old, but you get the idea. So Indigenous students who achieved the national minimum standards for writing in 2010, that you can see in this uh, graph here that there's, it covers year three, year five, year seven and year nine. And in each of those year brackets, it shows metropolitan, provincial, remote and very remote. And you can see the national minimum standards for non-Indigenous, which is the orange uh, bars in, on the orange columns is, um, it remains quite high uh, regardless of where they, they live. It, it fluctuates a little bit, but it does remain between 80 and 100%. Um, whereas the blue bars for the Indigenous students, you can see that it decreases dramatically as they get more remote. 
Also, almost one half of Indigenous young people in remote areas are not working and not studying. And I'll just have a quick look at that graph as well. So that just shows Indigenous people in overcrowded housing. So as they get more remote, um, you can see that the amount of people that are living, the overcrowding issues um, are increasing quite high as well. So the, co uh, the Council of Australian Governments uh, recognises in their Close the Gap reports that both education and employment outcomes are on average lower for Indigenous people, especially in remote areas. And following on from this, the Prime Minister's Closing the Gap report that came out last year indicated, as we know, that we have not met targets. So it states that rapid acceleration would need to occur if we intend to meet the targets surrounding education and sadly, the gap between, for employment outcomes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people um, has actually widened since the targets were made in 2008. So as trainers or representatives of the VET sector, we play an important role in the strategies for meeting these national targets and for closing these gaps. So according to the Council of Australian Governments, nat nationally agreed strategies forward include high quality training that is relevant to industry and employer needs and leads to further training or employment, and also ensuring that Aboriginal people have the work readiness skills necessary for employment. Now, using technology is imperative to both of these strategies. Now, lack of resources, lack of internet, and the cost and difficulty of IT support and repair are all challenges with using technology in remote settings. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a situation where you want to do something with technology and nothing works. There's no charges, everything's broken, nothing, nothing works. And to actually fix it um, just takes a very long time and a lot of effort. So it's a, it's a very real thing. Um, this photo here that you can see is taken in the Great Sandy Desert. And that is the workplace for these Nudara Ranges here. Uh, there's no internet, there's no reception, there, there's not even any buildings. And that's the case in this location and for many of the locations where these ranges work. So we know the challenges. Now what are the solutions? Firstly, being innovative and thinking of ways to make the great, great outdoors an effective training environment with little resources is really important in places like the ones where I work. So one very simple but effective technique for me is taking a projector anywhere I go. Uh, I can project on a wall if we have a wall. I can project on a troopy, um, four wheel drive, just throw a sheet over it and I can project on a troopy at any time or I can hang a sheet from a tree. And that works really, it's simple, it's, it's a very small thing, but it actually means a lot because you can, pr you can project uh, videos, presentations, images out in the field. Another successful initiative has been learning under the stars. So some of the training that I'm involved in out on country is at ridiculously hot times of the year. And sometimes we're training literally in 51 degree heat in the desert outside. And so even just seeing a computer screen in that situation is very difficult. And also trying to motivate students for a sit down lesson in the outdoors in 51 degree heat is also a very difficult task. So I found that uh, the way around that is to set up learning under the stars. So after a, work in the, after a day in the field, I'll set up a classroom in the cool of the evening and I'll set up tables and computers and I'll set iPads and a light. I can have a um, troopy as the whiteboard and a projector if we need it. And we've, we've got a really great classroom in the middle of nowhere. So many of the student groups that I work with are part of the Indigenous Ranger program. So the Rangers, they use a combination of cultural and traditional knowledge and Western technologies to manage and look after their country. So they are required also to document, report on and showcase their work as a means of reporting back to the community on what they're doing and their achievements. And they're also, um, they also have to report back to the Kimberley Land Council, that's their employer, and also government bodies as evidence that they're completing the tasks that they committed to in their work plans that's under their native title agreements. 
So to support the rangers in documenting and showcasing their work, I support them in developing their skills with a variety of programs. Now, one of these programs is Microsoft Publisher. So in developing these skills, the rangers are able to create all sorts of publications like newsletters and reports and posters and guidebooks and flora and fauna books. Um, oh, this, is a, this is an example here of just the cover page of, uh, that was a yearbook that the Nudera rangers created in two th from, yeah, 2015, 2016. And they've got a background, they've got logos, they've got a quote, they've got uh, Nudera ranger wonk wonky just means story. And country advice, congratulations, condolences, and Walmajadi language. And you can only see the cover there, but that was a really comprehensive document of lots of, lots of recounts and lots of photos and lots of information. And they put a lot of work into that. And they gained a lot of technology skills in creating that document. And they had something that they were really proud of at the end as well. And that was really useful for them. So most of the rangers had never used Publisher before when we incorporated it into our training. So you can see here in this picture, this is a poster made by the Nurura Women Rangers about their women's camp on country. So they were really proud to be able to create a poster and showcase their camp. I'll show you one more example as well of something else that the Rangers created using Publisher. This is a document created by the Guniandi and Nurura Rangers. Um, about their <coughs> ranger exchange trip that they went on to Maningrida in Arnhem Land. We've got a photo there, they've got comprehensive text. Lots of great photos and they've recounted every day in dot point. Day one, set up feral pig trap and went to shoot a buffalo to use the guts meat for bait for the trap. <laughs> <laughs> that must be the pig trap. Day two, <laughs> check pig trap, but no result. <laughs> it's gruesome, isn't it? <laughs> Constantly watching out for buffalo to shoot on site. So it was a feral animal management program, <coughs> in case you're wondering. <laughs> and in Arnhem Land, uh, there's a big problem with buffalo, it's feral animals, and so the rangers were taking back skills for dealing with feral animal uh, pigs and camels mainly on their country in the Kimberley. Day three, some awesome rock art. Mm -hmm. Day four, more carnage. <laughs> Exchange outcomes. They've got, a, they've got what's called a meat recovery program, which is just a fancy way of saying uh, they, they kill these pest animals and basically give the meat out to everyone they know and everyone lives of it. <laughs> it's good. Exchange outcomes and thank yous. So it's a really professional looking document that they can use to showcase their work to relevant groups and to the community. Uh, similarly, learning to use Microsoft PowerPoint has revolutionised the way the rangers can showcase and document their work. So during our training time, they build their skills to be able to create professional presentations that they can use in schools, in meetings and in forums. The rangers also use an app called CyberTracker. So CyberTracker software is free GPS program that's used to collect data in the field and to monitor all aspects of the environment. So the data can then be overlaid onto a map and the density and the location of whatever they're monitoring can be seen really easily on the map. And this program can be custom designed to suit different groups and different monitoring uses. So the rangers, they use CyberTracker on these rugged GTAC outdoor tablets that they have, and they basically record everything that they do, and that's a requirement of their employer. They, it's a big focus on this app and recording and monitoring everything. So I just took some screenshots of that app just to walk you through it quickly, just so you can have a little bit of an idea. So CyberTracker software, uh, this one's particularly customised for the Kimberley Rangers. Uh, you can see the first menu option, if you can read that, is land patrol or cultural sites. So just say that they're doing a land patrol on this particular day. 
Uh, then they choose whatever they're monitoring on this day, whether it's fire, weeds, native animals, feral animals, water, um, croc sightings or hunting data. And let's say that they're monitoring some feral animals on this particular day. And then they choose whether it's a sighting or a survey, whether it's feral animal damage or whether they're taking part in some feral animal control. And we'll just choose that one as an example. They choose the control method. So let's say they're putting out some camera traps. And then they choose the bait. And in this case, perhaps it's peanut butter. And it's really as simple as that. In one way, the CyberTracker app is very simple and very easy to use. Um, <coughs> It also records a location quite often and, they, and the rangers are required to add photos and descriptions. <coughs> so I can support the rangers in the field with the language literacy, numeracy and technology skills to navigate through this program and to record all relevant items until they're able to do it um, on their own. And then they learn to overlay the cyber tracker data onto a map. So you can see all the, the, the yellow line is a sequence of little dots as the CyberTracker software has taken a location point. And then you can see everywhere the ranges have traveled at this particular time. And then the little yellow crosses are every time that they've, take, they're, that they've uh, recorded something. In this, ca in this case, it was a particular weed. And, and then they've overlaid that onto uh, Google Earth. And if we're on Google Earth, you can zoom in and zoom out and get a really good idea of, of that location and what's going on and the density. And so this is obviously a really great skill for the, the, for the rangers to, to learn and they use it all the time. Now, some of the ranger groups also use a database to record traditional knowledge, to record their work activity and the environmental aspects of their country. Basically, this is a really effective way to support these ranger groups with language, literacy, numeracy, employability skills and the technology skills um, that they need to, to be able to use this database. Uh, I mean, this database, it, it's only one example and it's obviously really relevant to my students, but for everyone who is a trainer and for everyone in the vet sector, it's just about industry engagement. It's about finding out the requirements of the workplace and the industry of our students and finding out relevant, the most useful ways that we can support them with technology. So myself and a colleague, we both work with the Kimberley Aboriginal Ranger Groups and we spend many in industry engagement hours working with the Kimberley Land Council to decide on the best programs and apps to use in the field. So from an access pers perspective, it's in regards to if we think the, the apps are at appropriate level for different Ranger Groups and where, where they're up to. And it's usually during our access training time that all these apps and programs are rolled out and it's also during this time that the rangers practice their skills, learn to use these apps and build, yeah, build their skills continually. So the way that it works is basically my colleague and I, who are access lecturers, we, we're, not, we're not in conservation land, land management, so we put a lot of time into learning these apps ourselves and learning really the ins and out of the industry. And once we are uh, really capable with the, with the apps and the programs and their features, and then we think of the most engaging ways we can to teach them. And then we're there as well uh, to support the rangers in the field. So it's not just the initial teaching and then off they go. We go out with them in the workplace constantly and support them until we're really sure that everyone knows how to use these programs. So for example, earlier this year we ran a three day training block on the underpinning skills of mapping and GPS. So during this time, we were teaching the skills of many apps and programs that the rangers are required to use. So the Kimberley Land Council, they decided that they wanted the rangers to be competent in a list of programs and apps. And they were Google Earth, Avenza Maps, which basically allows you to track your moving location wherever you're driving around, a GPS Waypoint, which allows you to take a GPS point of wherever you are standing, a Spot Gen device, which is a tracking device, so that device can always be tracked and the location of that device can always be found, which is good if you're lost and can't communicate. And also the skills in learning to download maps from Dropbox so they can get the maps from their employer and downloading PDF map tracks off their, off their um, tablets and onto the computer. And then, so, so we went through all those apps 
and then we worked out the most engaging ways we could think of to teach them. So after the initial tutorials and the activities with learning the basics and the features of these apps and programs, we created Amazing Race sort of scavenger hunt style activities, which are my favourite style of activities. Uh, for example, uh, one activity the students were sent off within a five kilometre radius and they were to find a missing person who had a spot gen device on them. So the groups had to, before they go, look up the spot gen device software, find the coordinates of wherever that device was, uh, follow those coordinates, use their skills to follow those coordinates um, to way down the river it was, and find that person. And when they get there, uh, there's another situation set up. So they get there and, and they have to download a map from Dropbox, uh, which has a flight path on it. And there they follow that flight path to somewhere way over the other side of the country and get to another location. And there, they're, they're, another situation is set up and they uh, have to use GPS Waypoint app to take a reading of wherever they're standing, call up the helicopter pilot because there's an emergency and verbalise the coordinates to the helicopter pilot and get, and get help. Um, and then they, from there they go back to TAFE, they download the PDF map tracks of everywhere they've been on that mission, they overlay that onto a Google Earth map and they show that they've been to all the relevant locations. That's just one example, but that's sort of the style that we like to use with the rangers because uh, they're really engaging, they're fun, they're effective, and they're also very, I mean, they suit the rangers. That's the sort of styles and that's the sort of missions that they are on in real life in their workplace. Now, learning to take video footage and movie making apps has been another way the rangers have increased their skills to record and showcase. So they are learning to use video cameras on handheld devices, they're learning interview techniques, and they're learning camera functions. So I'll show you one example of a couple of the rangers who are learning these skills for the first time. So this is the first time they've done this. Is that recording? That's recording, isn't it? Yeah. Go on, JJ. Tell them what the camera do in this area. Napolo wala. Camel. Basically, um, photos and video have provided a really excellent way for the rangers to document their events and their cultural trips. So the rangers, they organise and, and facilitate such incredible cultural events all the time. And they indicated, they were the ones that indicated that they would really benefit from being able to document these events. So when I started my work with the rangers, I asked them what, what they wanted, what, what, how could I support them, and that was the main thing. And so that became a massive focus of our training and has been for the last three and a half years. I might just go back, to, so that, that video which, that when, when Amy Nugget was speaking, I forgot to mention, so you could see that the rangers were using different filming techniques. This is the first time that they'd ever done it. You can see it comes on, they're like, is this recording? And, you know, <laughs> and then, and then they, they're playing with different um, camera angles. They're playing, they're, you know, they're, they're doing the panning and they're coming back 
And it's a bit shaky, but for a first time, it's really good. And it's really important what they're documenting. So they're asking, Amy's the one that you can see talking, and she's an old Wamajari woman who walked in from the desert, so used to live completely traditional way, and walked in uh, in colonisation times of Fitzroy Crossing and now lives in town, but uh, has a very um, excellent memory and knowledge of the country out there in the Great Sandy Desert. So when they're going out there all the time, they're asking her in this particular case about they were doing um, feral animal management and the camels are a big problem. Their increasing population in Australia is a really massive problem and especially in the desert where water sources are so scarce and so precious. So you could see she was sitting next to some water. That's a, a living water, a gilla site. And it's a very precious site in the, in the um, desert. And you can see that, oh, I don't know if you could see, but she was saying that the camels had damaged that site and that they're, yeah, as she was saying, gumbu and gura, they, they poo and they wee in there and they trample it. And she remembered, she was talking about how she remembered another time and it's, all, and it's really damaged. And you can see the camels in the background. I don't know if you could, mm. yeah. But yeah, basically uh, being able to record the past and the, the present and document these sorts of things and these sorts of stories and these interviews with these old people is really, really important. So. These photos are of Women's Week, again, which was organised by the Nudara Women's Rangers. And that's an event that's basically designed to get Nudara women back onto country. So it's a big back to country trip into the desert. Um, so before even starting with movie making, what we started with photography. And so there were, I, I developed some tutorials and workshops for photography, um, photo editing, and also creating photo filing systems. Uh, these photos, the top, that's a yarning circle about women's health. This was a suicide intervention workshop. And here's the girls and the women uh, looking for junta, the bush onions, a little um, delicious. They're really, really, really delicious and really easy to find if you know where to look. So as soon as you go out in the desert, everyone's just gone, disappeared <laughs> looking for bush onions. And so I guess without these skills, this would be completely uh, undocumented. Now, I've tailored my delivery with the rangers to include on-country training for documenting many cultural events um, because this was what was needed. And that's with published documents, with photography and with movie making. So it basically means that I'm in an absolutely amazing and privileged position where they invite me to come out on these amazing cultural events. And while we're out there in the field, I set up tutorials to pass on these skills and then I'm there to continually support the use of these skills during that trip. And then when we come back, we'll go into TAFE and we'll use the computer room and consolidate all that and do what we need to there as well. So this trip, for example, was um, our passing of knowledge trip. So it was out to a place that these old people had not been to since they were very young and these young people had never been to. So there was no roads or tracks. It took us two days to get there, even though it's not really far away because we were literally ploughing through bush at one kilometre an hour. And with, with the old people walking in front, pointing out where to go. So two days later, we finally get there. I don't know how many flat tyres later. And they're passing on a whole lot of skills that are particular to that area. So one of those was making a raft in the old way that they used to in this area. So I guess, again, these cultural events are very specific to where I'm working and you may not all be you know, around these sorts of events, but basically I'm sure that there is many community groups across Australia who would benefit from these sorts of skills and support with documenting their work and documenting their events. So iMovie is the movie making program that I'm using at the moment because it's simple, it's easy to use and it produces a really excellent finished product. So I've developed a six part tutorial, um, tutor six part tutorial workshops and they cover how to record good quality video, planning your video, camera angles and camera movement techniques, how to edit using iMovie, sound, audio, music and the equipment that you need for good quality sound and also gaining inspiration and ideas from other videos. Then I've designed follow-up tutorials in how to interview and how to be interviewed, talking to the media, 
and also translating in your video as you could see with Amy speaking a lot a lot of the time they're interviewing people who speak in language um, which often which sometimes fine it just depends on the audience but translating into English is sometimes really or, or back the other way as well is often really important and these are skills that the rangers are increasingly required to use and, and also talking to the media increasingly so yeah making short videos and documenting their trips the work that they do in the field and the outcomes has been highly effective and useful for these rangers now for anyone who is in language literacy and numeracy iMovie is really intuitive and really easy to learn and as soon as you have an idea of the program and the features yourself it's really easy to set up these tutorials and pass on those skills to students and support them in that way now we run a biannual event with the rangers called smackdown uh, ranger groups take part in active outdoor activities based around problem solving team building language literacy and numeracy and the underpinning skills of conservation and land management and it's all out in the outdoor ranger environment so this year we added a mockumentary element to this program that was highly successful and highly engaging. So one of the range of challenges every, every time we have Smackdown is a camp oven cook off. Um, <laughs> And so, and the rangers love it. They spend a lot of time hunting for particular things to bring in for this camp oven cook off and everyone makes a big deal of what they're gonna cook and wants to win. And this year we decided to, uh, uh, that, a, that a mockumentary was required to accompany that meal. And each ranger group was given an iPad, they were given tutorials on iMovie and each ranger group was then judged on not only the meal but also the mockumentary. And they made incredible movies. Most rangers hadn't used iMovie and you wouldn't believe what they made, to be honest. Um, I'll, sh I'll show you one as an example, uh, just so you can see. This is one that the Nul Nul rangers made and it's called The Fish Whisperer. Guys, you guys gotta go get feet now. Yeah. yeah. No, what the food? What are you gonna do? Go out fishing. You have to go down the beach, try to get fish or something. Yeah. I know what to do, boys. Follow me. Old style. <laughs> Come on. Boys. Something. 
so it's good hey there's not much not much they didn't have very much time to make that they didn't have very much of any prior experience and it's excellent it's hilarious it's clever and but also the you know the the camera movement techniques the the angles the the steady hands the sound it's all really really good iPad, yeah, iPad. I always use iPads, yeah. Find it just because, uh, mainly because some people can't see things that are too small, uh, and it's really easy to sort of work with. I think everyone, I find the iPads really good. So you've got Apple computers back at the table. I don't. No, I. You can use iPads with with any computer. But for yeah. iMovie, how do you? So you do it on you do it on the iPad. You make the entire movie on on the iPad. It's really easy. Yeah. Yep, you make it all on there and then just download it on you to the computer. Yeah. So I've also found that engaging students with movie making is exceptionally effective with youth. Generation Z. <laughs> uh, in some cases, my young students are highly disenga disengaged and often there are issues with attendance. So harnessing their interest and engagement uh, are major factors involved in my design and delivery. Look at that bubble gum. <laughs> so I use yeah, iMovie on iPads, like I said, with my students, and they love it. The standard movie creation is really easy to use and allows creative freedom. iMovie also has, I don't know if you've ever seen it, templates available where you make a trailer. So they're sort of set up like a Hollywood-style movie advertisement. They're really easy to use. Um, they can provide, I think, I find a good introduction to the app. They can, they're, they're really restricting as a template if you actually have an idea of what you want to create, but just as a fun activity, as an introduction to the app, especially if you're working with students with short attention spans, they, are, they work really, really well. So these next few photos are uh, this, my Year 10 student group at Yiramalay Wesley College, which is a remote boarding school. So this is a photo of Billy holding the iPad there and some of the year 10 students at Yiramalay. And these students, every year, every year I work with the year 10 group and they are enrolled into a CERT one in gaining access to training and employment, which is an employability sk skills course. And I always contextualize it around a community project. So this group here decided that they wanted to do a conservation and land management project at a little spring called Yiramalay Spring, which is just nestled down about five minute walk from their school and where they all love to hang out. So I basically had everyone engaged in the program except for one person, and that was Billy. And he just wasn't coming really. And so on this particular day, I made, as a technique, I just thought I'd try making him team, I gave him so many tasks, I made him team leader, I made him responsible for delegating all the tasks, I made him responsible for making sure everything we needed for the project was in the troopy so we could take it down there, and I also made him responsible for, for filming, so I thought he might not do all those things, but maybe one of them will take his fancy. And so I showed him the iMovie app quickly and the trailer, and the trailer uh, function, and he was instantly engaged with that. And he took his role really seriously. So he filled the troopy with so much gear and all sorts of crazy things that I thought, uh, I had no idea what he was doing to be honest, but I just let him go. And, but little did I know, he actually had very big plans. And when we got down to the spring, basically he renegated the entire project and directed this movie. And he had everyone involved. So he was by like, every mean the director and he also made himself the main character. <laughs> <laughs> but he initiated everyone else constantly involved acting and editing and uh, filming as needed, including myself and including the mentors. But it was all under his very specific directing. So he had yeah, everyone captivated, involved and engaged the whole afternoon. And by the end of the session, he had a fully edited, fully created movie trailer called Blood on the Water. Oh. <laughs> so it didn't have anything to do with the conservation land magic management project that we were supposed to be doing that, that afternoon. But engagement, like I said, is always the most important thing with, with these sorts of programs. And also, it's an employability skills course, and, and from that perspective, I mean, this was ticking a lot of boxes in team building and organising and planning and communication and technology. 
So I'll show you Billy's movie, it's really short, just so you can see what can be created with a trailer feature in not very much time at all. Really good. <laughs> I don't tell him you all clapped for that. <laughs> You'll love that. So that was his first movie that he ever made, and since then he has made so many. He's obsessed with it. He loves it, and not just trailer features. I mean, really great short films and mockumentaries and documentaries and all sorts of things. And from then on, I also had him engaged in the whole program, and he was in, and he loved it, and he came. So some engaging movie making projects that have worked successfully with my year 10 students have been cooking shows, four wheel drive adventures and circus and backflip tricks. So I usually give the students the option to make either documentary or mockumentary and that keeps everyone happy and they just love it. Every case it's been really successful. Another free program uh, as well that is good is called Photo Story. I don't know if anyone's ever used it. So I haven't used it in a while but it's basically where you put a slideshow of photos together and then you can add narration and effects and um, music over top of that. And yeah, I haven't used it in a while, but my, my uh, high school students used to really like that program too. I'll show you another excellent program that I like to use a lot. It's called Canva. Is that, who's used Canva before? A few people? Yeah. It's great. So it's incredibly simple. It's free. It's online. It's a graphic design program. So everyone can be a graphic designer with this program. So you, you can use it on the computer. It's also an app that you can use on your devices. So this program I use myself personally to make all sorts of things all the time to showcase the programs that I, that I deliver and just all sorts of things in my personal life as well I've created on here. And I also uh, share that with, and introduced it to my students as well. Another really great program is Powtoon. Has anyone ever used Powtoon? It's a online program that's used to create animated presentations or videos. So you choose the subscription that you want. Uh, it's, not, it's not free. Well, there might be a free option with it, but it's quite restricted. Um, but you basically you choose the access that you want. So I've got an education subscription that allows me to set up a virtual classroom so I can use it myself and I can set up a registration for my students to use it and I can see what they've made. And the, the program has so many different animations and characters and, and options to choose from. They can create whatever they want in the animation world. And, and create really fun attention grabbing videos and presentations. So the best way if you are going to use this program with students or even for yourself, the best way I find is not to start with the animation but to start with the voiceover. So uh, with my students I get them to write a script first, then I get them one minute. Whoa, I must have missed my other prompts. Uh, <laughs> I get them to record a voice, a voiceover first and then practice that so they're either so they can read it naturally or they can just speak about it naturally and then record that and they can keep recording it until they're happy with their product and then from there they add the animations over top. It's really simple, it's really effective. One of my Year 10 groups created a Powtoon presentation to propose their idea that they had to have a rec centre at their school and they loved the program and the, their finished product engaged everyone who saw it and everyone loved it, was really impressed. So there are, I guess there's countless engaging ways to incorporate technology into training. And 
so that it's relevant and so that it's useful for our students. So access lecturers, I guess, um, in a way I'm lucky, we have the opportunity to focus on this. And if you'd like to, like I said earlier in the panel, if you'd like to have, if you think your students would benefit from a technology focus and that they need that, maybe you could partner up with a CAVS or, or USIC lecturer and they can add extra um, contact hours to your program and they can focus on that element and they can deliver that. And handheld devices have made it easier than ever to bring technology into our training environments, even the most remote ones. So I encourage anyone who delivers in a remote setting or who is going to in the future perhaps, um, not to let the challenges prevent them from incorporating engaging technology. So be innovative, think outside the box, get a set of iPads or tablets, that's imperative, and make it happen. Otherwise, our students will miss out on what was probably going to be a very valuable opportunity for them and with their employability skills. And luckily, because I think I've run out of time, that brings us to an end.